And it happened that while he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he questioned them, saying, Who do people say that I am? They answered and said, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but others that one of the prophets of old has risen again. And he, did, he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, The Christ of God. But he warned them and instructed them not to tell this to anyone, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and raised up on the third day. And he was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes, when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I say to you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Pray with me. Use me as your mouthpiece. Speak through me. Give me courage to, to speak your truth. Open our hearts and open our minds uh, to receive what it is you want to tell us today. Amen. Okay, well, I think we're down to two minutes. <laughs> um, my wife and I went to school in uh, Manhattan, Kansas, and how many of you guys know where Manhattan, Kansas is? Yeah, go K-State. <laughs> There's like two of us, and like, yeah. <laughs> um, and like most, I mean, it's, it's about the size of Clinton, and there are plenty of billboards around town, and I'd noticed that there was one billboard um, that kind of it, it irked me a little bit when I drove past it every day, and it was an advertisement from some bank, um, and they were... They're advertising some service like free checking or certain interest rates. And so they had the advertisement on the billboard. And then underneath the advertisement, it said, because you deserve it. And as I'm driving past it, I'm thinking, I do. I deserve that. Well, I don't know how I earned that interest rate, but I'm glad. Uh, but it, it, it got me thinking about all the things that, that, I mean, I've noticed it in different marketing techniques that advertisers will say because you deserve it and and half the time it's like there's no way you could deserve free checking I don't I don't know what you could do that inherently deserves free checking but we do tend to think like this we do tend to have this this idea of, of I deserve this much I, I deserve this I deserve that and I'd say largely that happens because of our, our, our culture, our, our Western, um, sometimes puritanistic, sometimes uh, capitalistic, sometimes very just American way of understanding things is I do this, therefore I deserve this. And we have this, I mean, this infiltrates how we think. I, I work this many hours. Sorry, this is making all sorts of noise. I work this many hours and therefore I deserve this much money. I've, I'm this old and therefore I deserve this much respect. I've been in this church for this long, therefore I deserve to be treated this way. And we have this sense of entitlement. When I was in college, around the time that I saw this, this billboard, um, I was reading C.S. Lewis and I came across one of, one of the things that he wrote, and if you don't know who C.S. Lewis is, he, he wrote The Chronicles of Narnia, but he's, he's known as probably the most influential Christian thinker of the 20th century. Um, and he wrote something, and I, tr I went back through all my books and tried to find it, and I couldn't, but I'll just give you the general idea of it, because it was probably a long quote anyhow. Um, the general idea is that people, people get offended, people get upset and angry, and Nine times out of ten, the reason that that happens, or even maybe all the time, is that we have expectations. We, we have certain, a sense of entitlement, a sense of things ought to be a certain way. And when that doesn't happen how we think it ought to, we get upset and we, and we get defensive and we get angry. Um, 
and anger is an it's an empowering sort of emotion. A lot of times when people are, are sad, um, they get angry. It's because it makes them feel like they're a little bit more in control of the situation. Um, and it, it it kind of blew my mind when he said this. We when our sense of entitlement, when our sense of what our expectations or what we think we deserve or what ought to happen is is disrupted, we we get angry, we get upset. What he goes on to explain and is is that quite honestly we don't deserve anything good. And when I when I read like in Romans three twenty three, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and then th- three chapters later, for the wages of sin is death. Right. All have sinned. For and we all deserve death. Now, we all deserve destruction. We, to be completely honest with you, all the hours you work in a week put aside, all, all, all your achievements, all the things that you've done in your life, if we tallied them all up, if we take what this book says and really, really apply it and, and send, bring it home, what you really deserve, what I really deserve, is hell. What we really deserve is destruction. What you have honestly earned in your life is separation from God. Now, I'm not talking about inherent worth or, or, or value. Um, you are made in the image of God, and therefore, inherently, you have unsurpassable value. What I'm talking about is what you've earned. If, if we add up all the things that you've done in your life, what you've earned is destruction. I was at a punk rock show a couple years back, and I'm listening to the band. At least I'm trying. It's noisy. It's not good acoustic. Sounds echoing off the wall. And I couldn't really understand most of what they were saying. But I did catch one thing that the singer said, or sang, or screamed, or something. <laughs> he, he says something to the effect of, God save us from ever getting what we deserve. And I thought, how terribly appropriate. God save us from ever getting what we deserve. Because if I think in my life, if I, if I were able to pull together all the good that I've done and all the bad that I've done and, and tally it all up and then pour it back on myself, if I, if I were, if every evil, selfish, wicked thing that I ever did or said or thought ever came back to bite me, I'd be ruined. I'd, I'd have no job. I'd have no marriage. I'd have no friends or family. I, my resources, my money, everything would be gone. If everything that I did or the good that I should have done and neglected to do came back to bite me, it, w- it would be hell. And I think that that's, that's a proper way for us to begin understanding this, is that we don't deserve the good. We don't deserve nice things. We don't deserve a life of comfort. We don't deserve to be treated with respect. Because, quite honestly, we haven't earned it. We think we have. Our culture has taught us that we have. We don't have to really do anything to earn it, but we haven't earned it. Thank God for grace. Thank God that I don't get what I deserve. Now, um, if if you're if you're not a Christian or you're visiting or, or maybe you're not sure if you're a Christian or or you just have questions, feel free afterwards to come and ask me or, or talk to Bob or Dennis whenever he gets back. Um, because I do, I do want, if you, I think that this can be confusing sometimes. But I want to look back at, at the passage that, that we read. Um, and Paul talked about it a little bit. This um, is it, Peter's confession. Um, everybody knows Peter's confession. It's, you know, you are the Christ. And different gospels, he says it different ways. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
you are the Christ of God. Christ being Messiah, you're the chosen one. And I noticed that Peter's confession appears in all three synoptic Gospels. Now, if you don't know, there's four Gospels. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are considered synoptics because roughly 85-90% of what's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke um, is pretty similar. Roughly 80% of what's in John isn't in the other three Gospels. Um, that's what I mean by synoptics. Peter's confession appears in all three synoptics. And every time, bear in mind, the Gospel writers didn't put things in the same order all the time. To emphasize different points, sometimes they would order things differently. Um, but in each one of the Synoptic Gospels, when, when Peter's confession comes up, it's very shortly after followed by this teaching of denying yourself and taking up your cross every single time. And I think that this makes sense because part of confessing Christ as our Lord, part of saying, I'm a Christian, necessitates that our lives are characterized by denying ourselves and by taking up our cross. Um, but I think, I think we lose some of the, some of the gravity of what this, this passage is. And I, I really do want to focus then on verse 23 where he says, um, and, it, and it was, he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And I want you to understand, it's not, it's not if most people want to come after me, if most people want to follow me, if anybody, if anybody wants to come after me, he not could deny himself, he must deny himself. He must take up his cross. But I think, I think the word cross has lost a lot of, it, a lot of its weight over the past 2,000 years. Because for us, in our culture, a cross is a nice thing that we put on our church buildings and we make them into little gold jewelry and we hang it around our necklace and wrappers get tattoos of them on their arms. For us, a cross is a nice decoration. But I want to explain to you what exactly it was that would have come to mind when Christ first said this to the people who, said, who wanted to follow him. The cross in the first century was... It wasn't something you talked about. Um, we talk about the cross. We're comfortable with it. The cross means something hopeful to us. In Jesus' time, the cross was something um, much more sinister. In Roman society, you didn't talk about the cross in polite company. Um, much like, like stillborn babies, bowel movements, things like that, you don't talk about these things around the dinner table. You don't talk about this stuff in polite company because it's just, that is Rome's kind of dirty little secret. Roman citizens could not be crucified. If you were a Roman citizen, you could breathe that sigh of relief that I don't ever have to worry about being crucified. That's something that the Roman government saved specifically for their non-national enemy, or their non-domestic enemies. It was not our people, but if, we, if you give us good reason, your people will have to suffer that. I want, I want to explain to you what happened when Jesus was crucified. Not, not his, his flogging beforehand, but just the crucifixion part. Just the part that everybody who was crucified would go through. Just the part that when Jesus said, take up your cross, his disciples would think about. As a child, I didn't really understand how a cross killed a person. I, I'm a little kid. I'm in church. I see pictures of Jesus hanging on the cross. And I think to myself, oh, he's bleeding. He must have bled to death. And I've always kind of, I just kind of thought that. And it wasn't until high school that I realized how a cross kills a man. Um, so I'm going to try and walk you through this. I'm sorry, this is cutting into coffee hour. Um, <laughs> but what, what a cross did is, is the um, crucifixion kind of began with the walk up to the public place where a person was crucified. And they would have to carry the cross beam on their back um, and so they're carrying the instrument of their death up to this public place so that everybody can watch them die. And they get up there, and here, let me show you. They get up there, and what they do is they lay down on the crossbeam with their arms stretched out, and then the Roman soldiers would drive nails 
through their wrists. Um, our translations sometimes say through the hands. The Greek word means anything from the elbow up. And we know from, from other writings that it was the wrist because it wouldn't make sense to drive it through the hand. You don't, if you drive it through the hand, all that weight is going to make it tear out and then people would fall off the cross. So they drove it through the wrist. Now, when you drive a nail through a wrist, right here, so you medical experts, you probably know this, right here is your median nerve, which is the largest nerve leading to your hand. And if you've ever, if you've ever like hit your funny bone, and it's, it's obviously not funny, it hurts, but if you've hit your funny bone, you know that it hurts to hit a nerve. If you've ever had a nerve pinch, you know that it hurts. What this did is it crushed the median nerve. And so if you can imagine that nerve when you hit your funny bone and somebody taking a pair of pliers and grabbing it and twisting it, that's almost what it would feel like to have your median nerve crushed. So they do that to the person. They crush both their median nerves, hanging them, nailing them to this, this cross beam. And then they use ropes to haul them up and put them on the, uh, the stationary beam, which is it's always in the ground. It's permanently there. And as they lift the person up, more often than not, the person's shoulders would get locked, popped out of their sockets. Um, their arms would become dislocated. And so they're hanging on the cross like that. They strap the cross, the crossbar to the up and down beam. And if, if you want a good visual of this, um, watch The Passion of the Christ. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you're hanging on the cross there. And what they do is they have, you're, you're naked. We always picture, picture Jesus with some sort of wrapping or something like that. But crucified people were naked. So you're absolutely naked up there, hanging on this. Your shoulders are dislocated. It's driven through your median nerve. Um, and then you have this, the up and down pole would have a, a block or a wedge of wood or a, a peg sticking out right about where your buttocks is so that you could kind of sit but it would hurt to do so. And then they would wrap one foot over the other one and they would drive a nail through both feet. Um, there was, they did find, archaeologists have found almost no traces of people, of the bodies of crucified people because most often after they were crucified they were just thrown into mass graves. We did find the body of one young man. Um, his name was, I think, how do you pronounce it? Yohanin, something like that. He lived about the same area that Jesus lived in about the same time, give or take 30 years. And they were, they were able to study his body to find out how people were crucified. And one of the things that I noticed when I was reading about him is that we always picture Jesus' feet like this, like where they're laid over each other like that, which is possible. Oftentimes what they did, at least what they did with this kid, is his feet his legs were twisted out like that. And then they would lay one ankle over the other and they would drive the nail through, through both ankles. And so he's kind of in this weird sort of position where he, he's kind of sitting Indian style but on a nail. But this isn't what kills you. This isn't what killed Jesus. As painful as this would be, what really kills you is that when your arms are trapped up here like this, your diaphragm is locked in the inhale position. So you get one breath, and then you can't exhale in order to take another breath. So you're stuck like this. So what victims had to do was they had to push up on that nail that they're standing on, or if, you're, if it was like this, they'd have to push, they'd have to turn their feet sideways so that they could brace the nail against their, their bone or just push it all the way up to their ankle bone. And you push off that nail and you use your hands to pull yourself up so that you can get a breath. And then when the pain is too extreme or your muscles can't hold out any longer, you let yourself down and you suffocate a little bit more. And then you would do that over and over and over again. And they said that oftentimes it's a very slow way to die. Many, most, most victims would live for days before they finally died of exhaustion, exposure, or suffocation. Eventually, a lung would collapse or something like that. 
is a very painful way to die. It's, it's a very horrifying way to die. In fact, it's such a painful way to die that the ancient people didn't have a word to explain the kind of pain that person who was crucified experienced. And so they, they made up a word. Um, the word is ecrucio, the Latin being from, ec, from, crucio, the cross, or crucified, or tormented. Um, so the word literally means from the cross. It's where we get our word excruciating. Oftentimes I hear people say, oh, that biology exam was excruciating. Oh, I stood in line at the DMV for 45 minutes. It was excruciating. But, but I think we misuse that word. What excruciating really meant was the kind of pain that a person went through on the cross. And you try to explain this. The ancient people tried it. Well, it's, it's like, uh, it's not like stubbing your toe. It's like uh, with the funny bone and you're in a lot of pain, like uh, you're suffering. It, it's bad. It's terrible. It's like being crucified. It's, it's like from the pain from the cross. And people go, oh, like that. That's, that is what it, what it means to be crucified. That is the image that, that would have come to mind when Jesus says, if anyone wants to come after me, he must take up his cross daily and follow me. It, it's not, if anyone wants to come after me, he must be willing to wake up early on a Sunday morning. If, if anyone wants to come after me, he must be willing to throw a few, a few coins into the offering. If anyone wants to come after me, he, he must be willing to suffer some minor inconveniences or, or some annoyances. It's, if anyone will, is willing, wanting to come after me, he must be willing to experience excruciating pain. And it's not even he must be willing to. It's not he, if anyone wants to come after me, he must be open to the possibility of one day having to suffer for his faith. It's if anyone wants to come after me, he must position himself on the road to suffering for this cause. And I don't know... I don't know if you guys are getting the gravity of what he's saying here. The crazy thing is that this is not optional. Later on in Luke, in in chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus brings up this teaching again, and he says, whoever does not carry his own cross, not whoever does not want to carry his own, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Is it sinking in? Because I think, I think we, we look at this teaching and we say, oh, that's very nice. Well done, Jesus. But in truth, are you suffering? Is your life one that exemplifies a suffering for Christ? I got to be real. Sometimes my life isn't. Sometimes it is. But... More often than not, when I take the time to reflect, I'm not. I'm not suffering. I'm not positioning myself to where it hurts to live the Christian life. And it has to. It it has to because he says, whoever does not carry his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. It's not whoever does not carry his cross or whoever is not willing to carry his cross or whoever does not like the idea of carrying his cross. It's if you don't do it, you're not a Christian. Which is crazy. <sighs> I want us to really get this. I want this to be something that we don't just say. And we don't just think, oh, that's nice. But I want this to be something that we really live. And... and I get the sense that a lot of times people don't want hold on. A lot of times people don't want us to, to say that, you know, oh, Christianity hurts, Christianity's tough. Um, a lot of times we just want it to sound like Christianity is easy because then people will want to be Christians. If you make it sound like a party, everybody's gonna to want to show up. And for those of you who are visiting or who aren't Christian, I want you to know the Christian life is a wonderful thing. It's joyous. It, it is is 
the most life-giving thing there is. But I'm not going to lie to you, it's not easy. If it were easy, it wouldn't be worth doing. No, nobody watches a great movie and the hero has to conquer all these odds and they go, man, I wish, I wish that would, had been easier for them. If it's easy, it's not really that great of a thing. It's not worth doing. The Christian life is hard. It's, it's impossible. Thank God for grace. Pray with me. Lord, help us to be real. For all the people in the world who don't think that, that you exist, sometimes I think we're the ones who aren't real. Lord, help us to be genuine. Help us to be authentic. Help us not to fake it. Help us not to put up a front. Lord, help us to be real. Help us to hear this and really apply it to our lives. Lord, be with us in carrying our cross this week because we can't do it on our own.